Hi and welcome to Synapse. This is Dr. Sonika. Uh, today's video is going to be uh, on esophageal pathologies. So let us start with the case capsule. We will see the differentials and then we'll study about the uh, esophageal pathology. So starting with the case, a 70 year old woman with long standing history of episodic non bilious projectile vomiting which contains undigested food and saliva presented with worsening of symptoms over six months. She has progressive dysphagia and history of weight loss. Now with this history, what is the probable diagnosis? So let me just quickly highlight the important keywords in the question stem. First is the 70 year old female. So she is an older elderly aged female. So we should always keep the possibility of a cancerous condition and she has long standing history this is also very important and complaints of vomiting but what is very important is the undigested food and saliva so the vomit is contains undigested food and saliva and uh, she has worsening of symptoms over six months it is long standing and the symptoms have gotten worse over a period of six months and she has progressive dysphagia. To make it very clear, progressive dysphagia meaning the dysphagia or the difficulty in swallowing is progressive. It starts with liquid uh, solids and then it is going to progress to liquids. So initially it is difficult to take solid substances. So the patient will prefer taking uh, semi-solid liquid substances and then finally they'll have uh, dysphagia to even liquids. So that is progressive dysphagia. Next coming to the history of weight loss. Now with all these three things in mind, so I would like to put 70 year old woman with history of progressive dysphagia and weight loss. So these three things suggest that my first probable diagnosis would be CA esophagus. Now what I should not forget is this long standing history. See CA esophagus is never coming as a long standing condition. So the patient will have uh, uh, usually it will come over a period of months. It's not long standing over years then it will get worse over six months and then the patient presents. So the long standing history is something which is going against the uh, diagnosis of carcinoma. And the next important thing is the undigested food particles and saliva uh, which is present in the vomitus. So these two things tell me that it is more of a, a motility disorder. So more likely it could be a case of achalasia as well. So my second diagnosis would be achalasia cardia. So now with this differentials definitely I'll have to work up the patient. So what will be our further step? So obviously the answer the first thing we're going to do is we can do a radiological uh, examination before we go invasive and then definitely an upper GI endoscopy is must. So let us say we went ahead and uh, we did the upper G uh, sorry the barium swallow to this patient and I'll just show you what was the image. So this was the image of the barium swallow. So here we have barium swallow the esophagus and then in the lower part we see that the esophagus has become narrowed like this it's eight o'clock so it is giving rise to uh, what's called as the bird beak appearance just like a beak of the bird like this right so this condition is known as achalasia cardia so let us just split the terms achalasia what does achalasia means actually achalasia means to relax to relax a meaning it is going to negate it so it is the failure to relax failure to relax what failure to relax the lower esophageal sphincter so this is the one this is l e s lower esophageal sphincter when this does not relax there will be dilatation of the proximal part of the esophagus okay which is going to lead to the stasis of whatever food that is ingested along with the saliva so that is what was causing her the vomiting uh, recurrent vomiting 
and also because see that LES is not going to relax so the um, peristaltic waves are not smooth so there will be obviously history of dysphagia there will be history of vomiting containing undigested food particles and saliva and most important another symptom if they had mentioned in the stem we would have directly gone uh, with this option so that would be the aspiration now because of the stasis of all the food particles when the patient lies in the supine position so there will be aspiration of the contents into the respiratory system so that will also cause them to have nocturnal cough so this is possible even in caesophagus as well it's not very specific to this but one very important uh, point in the history was the long standing uh, complaints of uh, vomiting and progressive dysphagia which will go against the diagnosis of ca and next most important was having the undigested particles in the vomitus so if it was ca it could be uh, hematemesis so uh, that could have been uh, one of the options in the uh, question stem now this is what was the condition uh, 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 finding in our patient now what is the next thing you're going to do so when you know that the symptoms uh, and the uh, radiology is suggestive of uh, the achalasia cardia so achalasia is a type of esophageal motility disorder so motility disorder now what are the uh, these esophageal motility disorders there are a number of disorders which qualify under this uh, heading and we use a classification system known as the chicago classification which we will see in a while we will see what are the conditions and how to segregate them and classify them so they come under chicago classification now what are the most important things to classify them as esophageal motility disorders first thing the patient will have features of dysphagia okay they'll have features of vomiting okay there could be history of even weight loss as in this patient so having all these symptoms but yet there is no organic pathology this is extremely important there should be no organic pathology what do you mean by organic pathology there should not be any structural abnormality so to rule this out we are going to do an upper gi endoscopy and see so there should not be any growths any strictures or any obstructive lesions or webs so any of these okay obstructive lesions so presence of any of this will automatically rule out or negate the diagnosis of motility disorder so that means the motility disorders are purely physiological okay so they are physiological problems so there should not be any anatomical component in them so if the if these symptoms the anatomical problems are present and patient has dysphagia then that condition is known as pseudoachalasia so it's not actual achalasia you will have dysphagia but it is uh, not because of proper achalasia which is a physiological problem it is pseudo because you have an obstruction so now that we know uh, these things about our patient we will next go ahead with the second diagnosis the first diagnosis we did was the radiology so second investigation is when you know that there is a motility disorder it is physiological so we need to do a manometry so we'll do a manometry so it's a visual manometry so the one we do right now is called the hrm which is high resolution manometry high resolution manometry so that means there is something which is not high resolution so basically we had the um, conventional manometry which was done uh, in the past so there we had less number of sensors now what is a manometry manometry mano meaning pressure so we are going to measure the pressure in the esophagus simple so that is that means we need to have a probe we need to have a catheter which goes inside the esophagus having sensors which is going to pick up the pressure sensations and it is going to relay to a computer monitors and then we will see the result so i'll just uh, show you how the manometry tube looks so this is the hrm 
this is how the HRM catheter looks. So this is the tip which goes inside the esophagus. So what uh, so the tiny things that you see here which has been magnified here, they are all sensors, they are called pressure sensors. So a conventional manometry had somewhere around uh, 3 to 8 sensors. But this is the HRM one, so it will have uh, up to uh, around 36 sensors. So you will have more sensors. So more the sensors, better is the mapping. So 36 sensors every 1 centimeter apart. So this one was somewhere around 3 to 5 centimeters apart. So because you have lesser uh, number of uh, sensors and more area to cover. So less sensors, so you, you could cover. Uh, um, you know the same area with you know gap of 3 to 5 centimeters here with 36 sensors you can keep the uh, sensors at 1 centimeter apart. So this catheter goes inside and these are the sensors which are going to uh, relay our data correct to the uh, computer. So just mentioning that uh, whatever data we get from this so we map it okay so that they are called as EPT. How our ECG gives an echocardiogram okay so similarly our HRM a manometry gives EPT okay which are nothing but the esophageal pressure topography topography okay so they are also called as uh, clause plots C L O U S C clause plots because they were described by Dr. Ray Clause and hence these plots are called clause plots. So I'll uh, show this image in a while uh, just to help you understand again split the term topography. So you must have seen in your geography you would have got maps of the particular area. So to know the altitude of the different areas in a given geographical location we use the topographic maps. So in the similar manner we are going to use topographies to represent the pressure system. Okay, We will understand this in greater detail. So I'll just move to that. Okay, so so in this image, so this summarizes the HRM and uh, what exactly are the components of the uh, HRM catheter. So how exactly do we perform this? So we are going to call the patient. Okay, so and then we are going to insert the catheter. So we are going to ask the patient to swallow some water so that we can uh, facilitate the easier passing of the uh, catheter just like how we insert the Ryles tube. So you ask the patient to swallow so that we, it can be easier. And then there are two kinds of sensors actually. So we have the water uh, level based um, uh, catheters and we also have the solid state catheters. These are uh, not very essential. Just what you need to know is that if it is a water uh, perfused uh, catheter, see uh, when the water level is going to give you a particular reading, you want the patient to be in the supine position. Otherwise, gravity tends to play a role. If it is a solid uh, state HRM catheter, you, the patient can even be in the sitting position. So once the patient comes, you put the catheter. If it is liquid, then you uh, sensor, then you make the patient lie down in supine position. Otherwise, the patient can be sitting and then you give a rest of 30 seconds. Okay, so we inserted catheter, we gave the position and then you give a rest of 30 seconds. So once, as in, because you have inserted the catheter, there will be some amount of peristalsis that is triggered because of that. So you let it rest, you let it pass. And next what you are going to do is we are going to study the t uh, 10 swallows. We are going to study the next 10 swallows that the patient is going to have and uh, map our pressure system, okay, our manometric pattern. So how do we uh, um, assess the 10 swallows? We are going to give the patient 5 ml of water and we ask them to take uh, swallow it in 10 different swallows which are 20 seconds apart okay so I hope I am clear I'll just mention it here see so we are going to give 10 ml uh, or basically we are going to give uh, 5 to 10 ml of the water to the patient and then we ask them to swallow this so see 5 to 10 ml of water and we are going to ask them to take 10 swallows with the same amount of liquid which is spaced 20 seconds apart. So here you have the first swallow, then you have the second swallow, then you have the third swallow. 
again 20 second gap here 4th 5th 6th 7th 8th 9th and 10th okay so we have got our 10 swallows so our senses would have picked up the information and then we'll have our plots so this is how we perform the HRM manometry now I'll just quickly show you how the manometry looks see this is the traditional manometry so we are told they were very uh, we have like three to um, eight sensors we have one two three four five sensors here look at the distance so they are placed at uh, five to uh, two to five centimeters apart so in this case it is five centimeters apart so it is not adequate correct now look here look at the number of sensors that we have we have more sensors at lesser distance so we said 36 uh, uh, sensors at one centimeter apart okay and the image that you see to the right is the HRM this is the clause plot or the EPT that is esophageal pressure tomography uh, sorry topography now what you need to understand to uh, read a particular uh, a graph is three terms okay I'll come back to this I'll just explain the three things that are necessary Okay, so there are three terminologies that are necessary to understand or to interpret the clause plot. First is called as the IRP. How, what is the full form? It is integrated relaxation pressure. Okay, so again, this if you try to read from a standard textbook, it is quite confusing. So let us try to understand this in very very simple terms again the logic is to break down the terms into sections okay so the first section is going to be integrated so you know when you integrate something it means you're taking an average you're summing up you're adding something so that is meaning it is average it is average of something we'll see what it is okay next it's in the third part that is pressure so we are talking about an average pressure Average pressure of what? The whole game is about the lower esophageal junction, correct? So, of lower esophageal sphincter. Okay. Now, let me complete the definition and we will understand it again. So, I'll write down the definition here. So, it is the lowest average pressure of the LES or the GEJ for four seconds within 10 second relaxation period okay now can you make sense out of this definition so the first thing we told is it is integrated so we're taking the average we're taking average of what pressure which pressure pressure of the LES we have average pressure of the LES okay so this average for how many seconds for four seconds okay within a 10 second relaxation period we have 10 seconds of relaxation period in that we are taking the average of four seconds they could be contiguous four seconds or it could be non-contiguous four seconds so basically four out of the 10 seconds ka relaxation pressures we are taking and what it's see it's a relaxation meaning what the pressure will be low when you're relaxing so the sphincter is relaxed the pressure in uh, in that area is low so it is the lowest pressure okay so that is IRP so now I'll tell you the normal value of IRP normally the IRP should be less than 15 mm Hg how to understand this when the pressure is below 15 mm Hg during the relaxation period that mean that means that the LES is relaxed and this food or whatever substance that is in the esophagus can pass into the stomach let us say at relaxation if your IRP is more than 15 that means it's not relaxing that is why things are not going from esophagus to the stomach that is why you're going to have build up of all those uh, so you know saliva and undigested food in the esophagus that is what happens that is IRP so IRP means immediately you should get the function of the LES in your mind and then you can remember the definition and remember the normal term I mean the value so the next term I want to introduce here is the DCI okay so these are the terms that you will come across if you're reading uh, this topic from a standard textbook so DCI refers to the distal contractile integral 
integral. So what does this mean? So before I give you the definition, I want to give you the units in which it is mentioned so that you get an idea. So it is mentioned as millimeter mercury times second times centimeter. So once again, I want to go back here and I want to show you this image. Okay. If you see the cross plots, I'm going to use a different color. Okay, I'll go with black itself. Right. So the x-axis is your time, that is in terms of seconds. Your y-axis, okay, is centimeters, which they have not, okay, mentioned here properly, but it is centimeters. This is how many centimeters you are from the uh, LES. So this is LES. This is your upper esophageal sphincter. Okay, so you see this. This is a normal clause plot. So, if you see the this area, this is the upper esophageal sphincter. This area is the lower esophageal sphincter. So your y-axis represents the length of the esophagus in terms of centimeters. Your x-axis is time in terms of seconds, and you see the colors. The color is what is your topographic uh, representation of pressure. If there are darker colors or warmer colors such as red and pink they are high pressure areas you see here purple pink red orange but you have colors cooler colors like blue green they represent lower pressure areas now with this if we look at this definition now you'll be able to understand that it is mmhg that is your pressure that was your color um, chart and this seconds was the x-axis, centimeters were y-axis. So that means you know from mathematics, if you have to calculate the uh, volume, so you get, you. Well, how do you calculate volume? You'll do length into breadth into height, same thing. So you're going to consider it as a cube and then you're going to measure it. So now what exactly does this indicate? Before I give the definition, you know the unit now and I'll just tell you what it indicates. It indicates the force of contraction it just tells you the intensity of contraction of your esophagus meaning how um, how much pressure okay how much force does the esophagus really generate so it is tells you about the force of contraction of the esophagus okay this is what it indicates right so that is what it is now i want to tell you the normal value as well so that is the, de this is the definition, this is the understanding, okay. This is the unit and let me tell you the normal value. Okay, it is 450 mmHg, it should be more than or equal to 450 mmHg up to 8000, up to 8000, it should be less than 8000, this is normal. So obviously there will be abnormal as well. So you'll have ineffective. What, what do you mean by ineffective contraction? That means it is above 100 till 450. That is called ineffective. And the other term is failed contraction. Failed as in less than 100. If your esophagus is not able to generate pressure of more than 100, then it is called failed contraction. So we have failed ineffective is 100 to 450 normal excuse me normal is 450 to 8000 and the last one i want to write about the other uh, part of the uh, spectrum that is hypercontractile hypercontractile esophagus so what does that mean here the dci will be more than 8000 so it can go up to 12000 14000 right so this is what is important in this slide so let's go and talk about the final term that we need to understand to go to the plots. It is distal latency. So what is distal latency? It is the duration of time between the upper esophageal sphincter relaxation and the onset of your contraction complex. Okay. So you know, in, physio in physiology, we have seen latency is what? It is a time gap between some two events okay that you're trying to understand so this is defined as the duration of time 
okay between the upper esophageal sphincter uh, sorry relaxation relaxation and the esophageal contraction esophageal contraction so what does this actually mean when does the upper esophageal sphincter uh, relax it is when your foot bolus enters the esophagus correct so the constrictor muscle has to relax only then the bolus will move into the esophagus and then the esophageal contraction will begin so that period is known as the distal latency so what is the value of distal latency it has to be normally more than 4.5 seconds if anything more less than 4.5 seconds will result in if it's less than 4.5 seconds it results in premature contractions premature contraction so we know anything that is premature is not very good so the esophagus will act rapidly and it will act faster right okay so now we have understood the three terms okay what were the three terminologies that we have seen the first one being the IRP Integra integrated relaxation pressure we know how to split it and we know the definition the second term was distal contractile integral the third one was the distal latency a quick recap of the values this is it should be less than 15 mmHg DCI normally is between 450 to 8000 so we know what is failed ineffective and uh, hypercontractile values and the distal latency is usually more than 4.5 seconds so these are the three normal values that uh, you need to understand so with the understanding of these three terminologies let us uh, go and understand the pathology of achalasia so if you have read from standard textbook the achalasia cardia is having three subtypes achalasia has three types okay so now let us see what are the three types of achalasia very simple this is what we know here the esophagus is dilated you have very narrow opening because the LES is not relaxing and this is your stomach okay now if the LES is not relaxing it's not opening okay so we learned one element out of the three terminologies we learned related to LES pressure that was IRP so what is the criteria to classify uh, esophageal motility disorder as achalasia is that the IRP has to be more than 15 mmHg that means your lower sphincter lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing so this is your first important criteria okay next Next, uh, I'll just mention the types here. So first, we'll talk about the type one. This is the classic type. This is the classic type that we have been studying since our MBBS days. Okay. So in this, what happens? The LES is not relaxing. The LES is not relaxing. We know that. And the rest of the esophagus. Okay. There are no contractions in the rest of the esophagus. No contractions. So what does that mean? That means the DCI. You have all failed contractions. So your DCI is less than 100 mmHg times centimeter times second. That's the unit, correct? So it is failed. Type 2. In type 2, what happens? This is also known as the pan, -es pan esophageal pressurization type of achalasia. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm so sorry about this. That was funny. Pan esophageal pressurization. So, in this, what happens? You have uniform contraction of the esophagus, but the LES is still not relaxing. Okay, this pathology is still there. So, what are the points here? Our IRP is more than 15, and our D we, do, we can't calculate DCI. This is one catch here. We can't calculate our DCI because the whole esophagus is pressurized. There is no proper swallow. There is no proper uh, esophageal, uh, you know, um, pressure wave. 
okay or a uh, after you swallow there is no pressure wave that is generated so you cannot calculate dci in a case of pan esophageal pressurization i'll show you the topographic chart for this as well so that you can understand the next is the type 3 this is also known as the spastic type of achalasia so you have spastic contractions here okay so what well, spastic what do you refer uh, what do you uh, remember when i say spastic See, this is achalasia cardia. So again, your IRP is more than 15. Spastic means it is happening more often. Okay, that means your latency period has reduced to less than 4.5 seconds. Okay, this is how we classify achalasia cardia. So the just revising. So first type is the classic type. Second type is panesophageal pressurization type. The third type is known as the spastic contractions. So for any achalasia cardia, your IRP will be more than 15. For classic, there are zero, 100 per, uh, zero contractions or 100% failed contractions. So your DCI will be less than 100. Your second, you cannot really calculate a DCI, but your IRP is more than uh, 15 and third is spastic so your IRP is more than 15 and you have spastic contractions that is because your latency period is less that is less than 4.5 seconds so these are the types of achalasia cardia okay and uh, with this we have studied everything about achalasia cardia I am just going to show you the topographical uh, representation this is type 1 this is type 2, this is type 3, okay. So as I have mentioned, if there are red areas, it means high pressure zones and we know that this area corresponds to the upper esophageal sphincter and this area corresponds to the lower esophageal sphincter, okay. If you can contrast, look at this area where you are having red spots near the lower esophageal sphincter, compare and contrast this with this, okay. Normally, you should not have uh, the high pressure areas exactly at the LES okay so th this is where you have started the swallowing has started here okay so this is over time this is how the wave is moving and it is ending here okay so if you contrast that and this here you already have you you have a higher pressure system already because the LES is not relaxing that means your IRP is more than 15 okay if you and, and then you see DCI is less than 100 how can I say that because there are no areas there are no red areas no pink areas no warm colors here absolutely 100% failed contractions here uh, now do you understand why I said DCI cannot be commented in type 2 because this is area of pan pressurization you see there is uniform pressure there is green color all around there is no uh, unevenness it's even pressurization everywhere so you cannot really appreciate your swallowing your peristaltic wave from the pan, pre uh, pan pressurization so there is no DCI here okay so and if you see the type 3 here we told it is spastic type look at the delay okay so if this is the delay we are talking about the latency is less than 4.5 seconds it's so short I'm, I can't say 4.5 exactly here I'm just telling it because it's so short here that is why you have your spastic okay the uh, esophagus has gone for high pressure areas I mean uh, spasticity that is why you have warmer colors here so these are the three types of achalasia cardia very important is IRP more than 15 mmHg depending on the DCI values okay and the DL values you will divide them into type 1 type 2 and type 3 okay that is about the achalasia cardia uh, and uh, so this patient uh, we have diagnosed that this patient is a case of achalasia cardia we will look if we look at her manometry uh, then we will get to know what type of achalasia it is right and then we will go ahead with the uh, treatment of the patient so what is the treatment option for achalasia cardia the uh, gold standard treatment is a Heller's myotomy so myotomy is just incising the outer layer of the muscle so that we can uh, reduce the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter so we have a number of options we have non-surgical treatment as well if the patient is old comorbid cannot uh, un uh, withstand the procedure we can go for pharmacological 
therapies like we can use calcium channel blockers, botulinum toxin injections, and even uh, pneumatic dilators can be tried so as to dilate and cause rupture of the lower esophageal sphincter. So these are all tried, but they are not very effective. They need multiple settings. That is why non-pharmacological treatments are not very popular and reserved only for those who cannot withstand the surgical procedure. Otherwise, gold standard will be a laparoscopic Heller's myotomy. So one important point that I want to tell about uh, the Heller's myotomy is, then I'll go and show that picture. So if this is the lower esophageal junction, a lower part of the esophagus and that is your stomach so your uh, incision will be like this the initial heller myotomy that was described by uh, hellers uh, had two myotomies anterior and posterior or rather placed 180 degrees apart but what we uh, usually follow nowadays is a single incision uh, single myotomy part so one very important point here that needs to be remembered is the extent what is the length of the myotomy you can't just insert the whole thing correct if you incise less it will be inadequate if you incise more there will be regurgitation so that is why so this length is extremely important on the esophageal side you go up to four to five centimeters and on the stomach side you go around two to three centimeters this is the most important part that you have to take away from this slide so on the esophageal side it is four to five centimeters on the stomach side it is two to three centimeters so you're going to incise it and then what happens if you do this there's always a component of reflux associated with it so that is why you need to combine this myotomy procedure with a fund duplication so either you can do a usually we do a partial fund duplication could be anterior uh, door application or a posterior topic uh, fund duplication so that depends on the surgeon preferences so Fund applications is a topic for another uh, video. I'll not go into the details. So basically, you take the fundus and you wrap around the esophagus to create the, uh, you know, fit snug fit around the esophagus so that we can prevent the reflux. So that is the treatment option for the achalasia. This is what the lady in our uh, case scenario will require. So just uh, finishing the video with the Chicago classification as I promised in the beginning that I will go through. So this is uh, quite, um, you know, confusing to remember if you have not watched the video so far because the understanding of the three terms that is the IRP, DCA and the distal latency are must. Okay. So with that, let us jump into this table. Okay. So first, let us say the IRP is more than our lower limit what is our lower limit 50 it's more than 50 and there are 100 percent failed peristalsis so what does it mean it means it's achalasia okay actually okay it means it is type 1 okay type 1 is dci less than 100 100 percent failed contractions type 2 was when you cannot talk about dci but your irp is more than one uh, more than 15 and type 3 is when your distal latency is less than 4.5 and see you don't take it for all contractions you you take it as more than or equal to 20 percent of contraction not necessarily 100 percent of times you will have uh, dl will be less uh, more uh, less than 4.5 seconds so it it means this condition is met by 20 percent or more than 20 percent of the contractions okay that is what it means okay let us say there is an, no problem with this okay and uh, basically you know that you have ruled out type 1 to type 3 achalasia okay let us say your irp is high but there is no problem with your dci no problem with the contraction contractions are normal then that condition is called uh, e esophagogastric junction outlet obstruction okay here it means there is a mechanical obstruction okay the lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing that is going to act as an obstruction that's why your irp is high but the contractions are normal so there there's no problem in the pathology of the uh, body of the esophagus that means it is uh, outflow outflow obstruction okay next let us say your irp is normal and what happens to your uh, dci okay and let us say your DCI is more than 8000. What does that mean? 
more than 8000 means you have very vigorous very rapid very vigorous contraction so that is called as the nutcracker or jackhammer esophagus okay so you will have high uh, intensity contractions so that pathology is called jackhammer and what do you mean by des again your irp is normal but your dl is less than 4.5 again that means you have premature contractions again you have spastic variety so this is how the barium swallow will look so you know that beaded appearance i'm not drawing it properly anyway so this is how your esophagus will look if you can google it up and see this is how the barium swallow image of des looks so why the spasticity we know that it is because of latency period when it's less it leads to spastic contractions so jackhammer is when you can give high pressure high pressure contractions that means your dci is more than 8000 okay so we have understood these things and whatever is below this uh, dotted line is not very important if you understand it's great here your irp is normal and more than 50 percent of your uh, contractions let's say are ineffective then it is termed as ineffective motility uh, disorder so they're all just minor disorders of peristalsis uh, not very important okay so and the next one is when more than 50 percent of your contractions are normal uh, then it uh, it is a normal condition it's not a pathology so this is how you go about your chicago classification understanding it and classifying the disorders always first thing look at irp this should be your step first look at the irp irp is high then look at the uh, uh, dci and the dl then it goes into achalasia part okay so i'll finally i'll just give you a last slide to just okay how to read how to understand the esophageal motility disorders so first thing is to look at the irp when your irp is high okay that means there's a problem with les next look is there a problem in the body of the esophagus is there a body pathology if body pathology is present what does it mean in the form of dci less than 100 or a dl which is less than 4.5 that means this is pakka your achalasia cardia okay one thing i want to highlight is achalasia cardia means there is a problem with the les and this problem with the body les plus body is achalasia and from the chart we know if there is problem only with the les only your irp is more than 15 okay but your pressure your body is normal your dci is normal dl is normal it means it is esophageal gastric junction outlet or outflow obstruction okay it's not achalasia anymore okay according to the classification it's a different disorder okay it might progress it can progress to achalasia cardi that's different but when you classify the disease it's not achalasia anymore it is uh, esophageal gastric junction outflow obstruction next one let's say your irp is uh, normal irp becomes normal now two variations can be there either your dci is increased or your dl is decreased if dl is decreased what will happen spasticity so you will have ds if the dci is increased you will have a jackhammer jackhammer esophagus okay so these are the most important esophageal disorders you need to know so the others i have told you they are minor peristaltic disorders so that is it that you need to know from this i hope uh, the chart and the concept has been made very clear so the concept of clause plots and epts are extremely complex as in you know there are a number of other things that you need to also understand but i have tried to just mention the points that are important to understand have a basic understanding of the disease there's something called p point d point and everything uh, not not very important at uh, this point and this is one of the topics that even postgraduates uh, fail to understand in uh, clear details and depth so i hope this uh, video just uh, uh, helps you um, tackle this topic in a, a better way so that you can start with your uh, strong basics after watching this video now you go and open up uh, sabiston or main goes okay a lot of depth is not given in bailey so it is just a basic description in bailey open up sabiston or main goes uh, standard textbook uh, of abdominal surgeries and you will get uh, more details on this so i hope i have done a decent job 
making this topic easier and simpler for you and uh, yeah thank you so much for watching and stay tuned i'll come up with more videos on the channel thank you